welcome to my channel. If you have been here before, you know it is my dream to be an entertainer. And part of that is my day job as a voiceover artist. So this isn't a craft video, and if you're only here for the crafts, I do not blame you at all. I will see you in the next one. But if you clicked on the title because you're interested in getting into voiceover, then I actually have created this two-part series that will go into the nitty gritty, the really, really honest truth, non-sugar-coated, no, take this course to find out the secret, honest behind the scenes look from someone who is doing all she can to make her dreams come true. These two videos are actually on uh, my blog that I have that is kind of dead right now. I really took my time with those blog posts and so I know that this information will be good if you are just starting out, if you have a loved one who says that they're interested or if you are trying to encourage someone else, this will really show them what it takes. And if you are watching this for yourself, this will really help give you an idea of where to start for real, for free, and uh, no, you know, nothing's behind a paywall, anything. I'm giving this advice to you from one artist to another so you can really see what it takes and what the first steps are. So without further ado, V.O. Carey, take it away. So I wrote this back in 2018, and as I'm reading this, I am updating some of the information and some of my opinions, but most of it is still 100% accurate, so I'm going to leave it as is. Just wanted to give you that FYI. I want to be a voice actor. Where do I start? Written by Carrie Fable, January 21st, 2018. After co-hosting the DragonCon voiceover panel in 2017, I was asked by several people to elaborate on my answers, as they appreciated my insight. It's been a few months since then, and I've unfortunately already forgotten most of what was even asked, so I thought this blog would be a great platform for me to delve in deeper and maybe help one or two people. Allow me to be frank for a moment. As many aspiring voice talents as there are, there are that many blogs, articles, seminars, webinars, and coaches explaining how to become one. What makes this blog different? I am what happens after you do what the FAQ tells you. I've been through all the 101 classes, and I don't yet consider myself a full-time success. I've made mistakes, and I am still learning. Reading my blog is like a senior in high school giving advice to the freshmen. They may not know as much as the teachers, but they're more likely to tell you things the teachers won't. So, if nothing else, I might save you some time narrowing down what your focus should be. Also, I'm not getting paid to sell you a service under a thinly veiled disguise of genuine concern and guidance. Shots fired? Indeed. Now, let's begin. I'm going to guess that if you are 25 years old or younger, your desire to be a voice actor came from your love of anime or cartoons, animation, video games as runner-up inspirations. If you're above 25 years old, you probably had some radio experience, either in college or professionally, and you're looking to expand your income. How close did I get? For me, I knew I wanted to be an actress since I was four. I have a distinct memory, also retold to me by my family, of standing outside and vowing that I would entertain people, even if I had to play the bad guy. Three years later, at age seven, my sister taught me what a voice actor was. The rest is history. Even still, it wasn't until after I graduated college and spent a few years aimlessly wandering that I truly realized my dream could become a reality. Seven years later, and I'm sitting here reading this post that I wrote. I don't make enough to support myself full-time yet, but I was able to pay off all of my debt and pay yearly self-employment taxes. So, how does one measure success? I may not be where I want to be, but I'm getting there. You think I went off topic, but trust me, I didn't. I knew I loved voice acting at the age of seven, yet I didn't even start on my journey until I was 27. I wasted 20 years before I even began to follow my dreams. It's like the Odyssey with less violence. So here's the meat of the answer for voiceover talent. First, you have to acknowledge that there is a difference between being a voice talent or voiceover talent and a voice actor or voice artist. If you go to a coach and they don't acknowledge this distinction, they only focus on the talent and not the acting. 
Why do you need to know this? Because if you've ever been told you have a great speaking voice or you really love reading out loud to your kid, you're on the path of becoming a voice talent. You will do voiceover for commercials, IVRs, which stand for interactive voice response, those voices you get when you call a doctor's office that tell you to pick a number, companies' internal training projects, and if you want to dabble, narration. For these, you will need proper diction, correct pronunciation, and usually a Midwestern American accent, i.e. the non-accent. In other words, the listener shouldn't be able to guess where you're from. If you have any sort of lisp or a lazy tongue or an incredibly thick regional accent, I recommend seeing a speech therapist first, or you will be extremely limiting your options. Sounds mean, but trust me on this. Chances are, if you've been complimented on your voice, you are good to go. Step one, the first thing you need to do is make sure you have the basic principles down. Go through at least a beginner seminar, workshop, whatever have you, to get the basic principles down. Sounds easy enough, and it is. It's not as intricate as a nursing degree, but just like a production crew has best practices, so does voiceover. The good thing is that unless you prefer to take an in-person or live course, even if you live in the middle of nowhere, you can still attend such classes through the magic of the internet. Here, dear freshman, allow your loving senior to do your homework for you. And yes, you may call me senpai. Do yourself a favor and go visit this one-stop shop, Global Voice Acting Academy, for all your coaching needs. Honestly, they'll be able to set you up entirely, and it's the closest thing voiceover has to a trade school at this point. This is not a paid advertisement, just a happy student. Here's an honest review to prove it. Some of their marketing tends to sound a little redundant in an attempt to get your money. You'll attend something thinking you need it and come out feeling like you learned nothing. From my experience, this was because I'd learned all this stuff elsewhere. So I looked on the positive side and was pleased to know that the service I received and that they were giving was accurate. That being said, the coaches genuinely care about you and are there for you always. David Rosenthal has gone out of his way to support me in his personal time, i.e. I did not pay a cent, and I am eternally grateful. They also provide tons of free information and resources, and if nothing else, I encourage you to subscribe and watch their YouTube channel. Global Voice Acting Academy is also run by actively working voice talent, which is poignant because you'll quickly learn a lot of vocal coaches are those who got out of the game. Their techniques might still be great, but their advice is most assuredly outdated. I also recommend Gravy for the Brain. They are UK-based, but they do have resources for America, and I found their information very helpful. You can do their whole series in a pre-recorded format, which helps as you consider this as like night courses. It's a monthly subscription, which means if you have time to dedicate just one month to classes, you can get everything you need to know for $35. It's usually $50, but there's a promo code flying around out there. I will say that the information they provide is really great, but after I took their courses, I did unsubscribe because I don't fully ascribe to the mentoring aspect as everyone's path is different. But if you can swing the monthly fee, they are a great group. World Voices Organization. So, at first, I really recommended them. They have a mentorship program and a wonderful list of resources for you. Honestly, I originally joined solely for the community. You are invited to their private Facebook page, and from there, the advice is endless. I joined them when they were early on, and membership was 50 bucks. It's now gone up to 100. I initially joined as it was a great community of people, but what they were advertising had not yet come to fruition, such as the one-on-one -on -one mentoring connection. I do recommend their PDF of basic best practices of the business side of things, which I will link in the description. And I do highly recommend joining if you have the money for their Facebook group. I mostly joined for the Facebook group, to be honest. They have kicked me out since I let my membership expire, which is understandable. It's for active members only, but I did enjoy my time in there. Ironically, I started the Wovo Atlanta chapter, and it does not seem to have been replaced. There are 13 members, but we were never able to meet up, so I stopped trying to set it up. Maybe one day I'll renew my membership and push for meetings. VO peeps. I never paid for a class, but Anne often works with GVAA, and so I found her through that. She's got a great podcast that I unfortunately only listen to every once in a blue moon. I'm too addicted to true crime. But if you want to network and engage, I believe VO peeps is probably the way to go. I do want to say a note about Bill DeWeese. He is probably the most popular individual talent coach in the community, or at least he was several years ago. He has a YouTube channel where you can get his advice absolutely free. 
I love Bill and I have used some of his stuff in my early days, but some of his advice that he continues to give is sadly outdated. That's not to say he's wrong, but things have already changed since he published the voiceover training products. The sentiment is still incredibly insightful, but some of the tips, like using Craigslist, is virtually useless these days. He now also sort of has a bad reputation, quote unquote, by some members of the community. But I think that's mostly a little bit elitism, if I'm being frank. Bill doesn't really see an issue with going where the paying clients are. Whereas a lot of people will say things like Fiverr are a waste of your time and will even hurt your career. I'm not going to touch that in this episode, but that is something you really do need to consider when you're actually ready to start. And just a note on such a voice. For a company that's been around 30 years, it's only just become a thing in the VO circles. It comes with a hefty price and seems to be more of a VO farm. You get coaching, which I heard is great, and a demo that I heard is not so great. And then you quote-unquote graduate, but that's about it. While you'll end up paying ultimately the same from any of the above training, it's just not worth it to me to go with such a voice. But I have not personally used them, so I can't say for sure. I just did some research when it was brought up to me. I think personally, GVAA is hands down the way to go with networking through VO peeps. I will also provide links to everything that I'm saying, but I'm going to provide more voiceover Facebook groups uh, that ranges from people just starting out to those who have been in the industry for decades. Step two, find a respectable coach to assist you with producing at least a commercial demo. My personal story. I was working at Connecticut School of Broadcasting and had the opportunity to attend one of their voiceover workshops. The instructor, Eileen Kimball, pulled me aside and told me if I was ever interested in pursuing to give her a call. Any time, she emphasized. I owe so much to her initial support and push. She became my coach and I studied with her weekly for a solid three months or so. My only regret is that because my budget was so tight, Eileen graciously recorded my practice sessions and used those for my demo reel. Listening back on that demo, it's apparent, to me at least, that some samples are delivered better than others, and this is why. 100% this lesson is on me, but I would highly recommend that even if you do use your practice scripts for your demo, re-record them for your final shebang. My demo served me well, and I actually redid one already, so luckily it didn't seem to hurt me by doing it this way, but it's something to consider in your budget. The people I mentioned in step one can all help produce demos, and there's also a list in the description of whom I've actually heard of, so you can't really go wrong with any of them. Again, I have gotten a demo made by GVAA. It was my animation demo, and I have booked a lot of work with it, so awesome. (laughs) If you don't use anyone on this list, just keep in mind you get what you pay for. My first demo was $300, and it shows. My animation demo was $1,200, and it's awesome. With that in mind, no demo is worth cracking $2,000. At that point, you're paying for the name associated with the production. Maybe it's a marketing technique, but it seems like a waste to me. Step 3. Studio Space While you are studying, start to build your home studio. 98% of all auditions are going to be on you to record and submit, and at least 80% of all gigs will allow or assume you have the studio covered. Some clients will insist you go to a recording studio, especially if you need ISDN or Source Connect, or will pay you enough to make it worthwhile. But honestly, I've only ever gone into a recording studio for coaching and to get my demo made because I wasn't doing the sound engineering myself. I've discussed my own journey with this in previous blog entries, and I'm not a sound engineer, so instead of reiterating great advice out there, I'm just going to share some reference material for you. I used to have two great articles I'd share with everyone, but both have been taken down. Guess they didn't want that information given out freely anymore. But I did find these others that can walk you through it. Honestly, it's so personalized to what space you have available. I used to have a DIY built whisper room in my garage, but now I have a converted walk-in closet. The microphone will always be a hot topic. Ask 100 people, you'll get 100 answers. Mostly this seems to be a popularity contest where name brand wins. 
I do just want to give you my personal experience that is a huge discussion, mildly controversial out there in VO space. My first microphone was the AT2020 USB, and I then upgraded to the AT2020 carotid condenser microphone with an ID4 audio interface. I now have a Scarlett Focusrite interface and a Rode NT1 microphone, so upgrades are a continual thing. But my point is, while many will scoff at the use of USB mics, I've recorded all of my gigs for the first three years of my career on that AT2020 USB with not a single complaint from a client. And I still use it as my travel microphone for when I'm on vacation. I did upgrade, but I sometimes have an issue with traveling with my interface. So my little USB has been my ride or die since day one. Quick synopsis of the difference. A USB mic is simply plug and play. You stick it in with a USB just like you would a mouse or a keyboard and bada bing bada boom, you are good to go. With the condenser, you need that middleman, the interface, which plugs into the computer and then the microphone plugs into the interface and you can get really, really detailed with it or you can get the super basic stuff, which normal voiceover, not music or anything, uh, one mic setup, you do not need anything special. Now, having moved to a condenser mic, there is an audible difference in the richness or fullness of my voice in my recordings. But I still do not regret going with the USB to start. It's a lot cheaper and simpler to set up. So while you're doing practice personal projects, it's a great way to get set up without having to wait and be overwhelmed with the amount you're spending. This is an investment, but there are certain areas that you can go the economic way for a little bit. Yes, there is a sound quality difference between a USB and a condenser with interface, but it's more that you can hear the difference when you compare the two, not when you're actually doing the work. Even when I submit my travel audio, I still have never received a complaint. Fun fact, when I do my YouTube videos, I use a Blue Yeti, and that actually has a better sound when you're out in a normal room um, than my AT2020 USB or a better mic. They're more sensitive, so they like closed, acoustically treated rooms. The Blue Yeti gets laughed at because everyone and their mom uses one of those for the podcasts. I wouldn't say it's a great mic for voiceover, but um, it is perfect for YouTube needs. I highly recommend that mic. I actually tried upgrading my mic. I won't name the brand because I don't want to diss it, but it actually is what killed my first interface, the ID4, and I had to switch it out for the warranty, but it kept it kept breaking. The technician, the sound technician I was working with said it would be compatible, but it I could never get the mic or the interface to work properly. So I actually returned the mic and I, I stayed with my AT2020 condenser microphone pretty much till now. I have the Rode NT1 that I bought for my travel and then realized it might actually be better quality. So right now I'm doing my testing as we speak to see which one I like better. But honestly, it really is great for my needs. I also use a Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 audio interface now. It's great. And uh, once you plug it in and set it up, you really don't have to redo anything. So I have the Rode NT1 came with its own little condenser, but it looks a little too basic. So that's why I want to play around with it. So the Rode gave me a little bit of an issue when I tried to travel with it. That's why I started, I can still use my USB. So yeah, microphones are you know, love-hate relationship there. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny. It can be so frustrating and so rewarding at the same time. So long and short of it, are there better mics out there? Sure. But it depends on your budget and your sound. I have a high-ranged female voice. You could have a low-ranged male voice. Since they are very different vocal tonalities, I can't recommend you a microphone for you. It actually has to go with your sound. Just like a different instrument might need a different mic. That goes way over my head, so I can't even begin to explain. (laughs) My advice would be to use the search feature on the Facebook groups I provided to see where they talk about microphones, and then see if you can listen to demos of anyone who fits the similar voice range as you, and see what they recommend because essentially they did the legwork for you. So find someone with a similar voice sound to you, try to figure out what microphone they use. But just keep in mind that what what might sound smooth for me might come off brassy for you. It is so technical. It's crazy how scientific almost it can get, but your clients really won't notice a difference. 
It's just really getting into the weeds with sound engineering. But the average person won't notice as long as it's crisp, clear audio with a quiet sound floor. As far as the audio editor, I have heard across the board that this does nothing for the quality of the recording itself. So pick an editor that you are comfortable using and stick with it. I was trained on Cool Edit Pro 2.0, which was the precursor to Adobe Audition 3.0. I now use Adobe Audition Creative Cloud. I have SoundForge, Audio Studio 12, and I've been dabbling with GarageBand and PreSonus Studio One. I also had to record a rather large project using Adobe Captivate, making PowerPoint presentations for a client, which would have been fine had the client's laptop not been so sluggish. Um, While I do not overly enjoy using Audacity simply because of the limited editing tools, it is an absolutely free download for both Windows and Macs. So if you are in a pinch or just as a backup, it's always good to have. Oddly enough, I have heard a playback difference between Audacity and the more advanced software, but I'll blame that on the computer speakers that I was using. I was in a company's studio, so who really knows? Just a note, once you get comfortable with an audio editor, you won't want to learn something new, and you will want to have more tools at your disposal that something like Audacity doesn't offer. Like I said, I currently use Adobe Audition Creative Cloud, which is now a monthly subscription fee based on what you want. I have the whole suite, which has video and photo editing tools, so you may not need that. But I also have SoundForge for my travel computer, which was a one-time fee of 40 bucks. I prefer Adobe because I was trained on cool Edit Pro, which is the predecessor, so it just feels like home to me. But honestly, SoundForge has never given me trouble, and I always use it when time is of the essence. I do have a Mac with GarageBand, but as I said before, I I had an issue, so it just hasn't earned my trust yet. (laughs) I have heard Twisted Wave, if you are on a Mac, is super popular, but I have not tried that, so I can't attest to it one way or the other. Step four, branding. This arguably is an optional step or one that can wait until later. But basically, create a website, develop a tagline, get some business cards, and potentially design a logo. While you don't need these, they can help you stand out from the endless sea of hobbyists. So here's my personal experience. As part of my senior seminar at UGA, I was tasked with creating a website for my acting. It was free from Moonfruit, which was a really fun website builder for the Java script or HTML impaired, but I think it has now since gone completely defunct. I had that website for about four years before I switched to Wix and bought a domain. Yes, all those YouTube ads are correct. Unless you know how to use WordPress to build a website, go with Wix for a very simple yet professional looking business website. There's also Squarespace, but I've never personally used that one. Saving money on not hiring an actual web designer was essential at this point. Every penny you can put towards voiceover should go to education or equipment. However, business cards and the like would again put you one step further. I did not have a logo at first, and I was never really satisfied with the tagline I created. I started with Atlanta voice actress. Then I had dependable, creative, inspired, or something. Your tagline isn't set in stone, but it's nice to have your name colon a descriptor. I kept for the longest time Carrie Favel, voice of fairy tales. This illustrated what I love doing while also being a play on my name. Favel is Italian for fairy tales and comes from the Latin word for fari, which is speak, or fabula, which means story. Yes, I am in love with my own last name. Thank you for noticing. Now I have kind of modernized it, so it's just Favel voice and content creation because I do a lot more than just voiceover now. I actually do know how to build WordPress websites, and uh, so my freelance work as a full-time artist kind of compiles in any kind of marketing, advertising, video editing. So I kind of just broadened my scope, but my image still has fairy wings on a microphone, which I just love. I used Vistaprint for my first two business card designs, which you guys saw in that previous episode. Uh, I did just recently use Moo. Very great. Absolutely love it. Step five, submitting. Once you feel confident that you can audition well and you have a demo, it's time to start submitting yourself to agents and to jobs. You may argue that since this could take some time, one of my agents took about two months to catch up to my email and sign me, you should do this sooner rather than later. I and many agents disagree with that. The agent is not your first step, it's the last step. 
get all your ducks in a row before you lead them to the pond. There is always exceptions, but you'll know if you're one of them. Then again, if your uncle is a talent agent, you've probably been signed since you were eight. Congratulations! In essence, you've graduated and can now play the game of marketing yourself to every and anyone who makes eye contact. Be careful treading these waters, though. I could make a whole thesis just on social media marketing, and having worked as a marketing manager, maybe I need to do that. Who knows? <laughs> Joining certain pay-to-plays is a great way to start immediately with auditions. Though some in the profession shy away from P2Ps due to the unfair rates, think things like freelancer, some are viable, such as Bodalgo, Cast Voices, VO Planet, Voice123. Research a bit before committing, as these yearly fees can add up if you join more than you need. My personal experience. While I was studying under Eileen before I'd gotten my demo, I joined Freelancer.com and a few fan-made projects websites. I did a few things for free just for the experience, like machinima YouTube videos and an indie game that is still in production. That is where I booked my first paying job, a children's audiobook for Thumbelina on Freelancer for $40 that the client sold on iTunes with its own illustrations. No, to answer your question, none of these were great professional gigs. However, they gave me invaluable practice working with clients, editing my audio, and meeting deadlines. While you are still in the studying, aspiring stages of your career, I actually do recommend taking a few of these free or low-budget gigs. That being said, as soon as you get a demo, a website, an agent, you are no longer aspiring and should hold yourself to higher standards. It's not just about you any longer. You have joined a community that needs to stand united in fair rates. However, can you have a that being said on a that being said? This industry is ever evolving and there are no industry rates for a lot of the new media that's out there. Just be sure you're not underselling yourself. Always check the GVAA rate guide sheet and work your way from there. Consider the scope of the people who are going to listen to this. If it's a local company that wants to do an internal training for 50 people, okay, you don't need to charge them $2,000. But if you're going to book a national commercial, you need to be seeing some green, hun. Meat of the answer for voice actors. What? You're probably wondering. I thought we were done here. You are if you want to be a voiceover talent. Check out my blog for more bloggy goodness. However, if you want to voice characters in cartoons, video games, what have you, you're going to need a bit more on the back end. Steps three, four, and five are the same, so that's handy. The first step to being a voice actor is acting. Why? As Bo Weaver describes it, quote, because spoken word is not primarily about having a good voice. It's just acting off camera. Put another way, voiceover is storytelling with a point of view. It has much more to do with attitude and emotion than voice quality, end quote. What motivates your character? How does she hold herself? What backstory might he have that would incorporate into his sound? I'm sure you've seen at least one behind the voice specials where you see your favorite actor hopping around the recording booth, maybe squinting one eye or placing their hands on their hips. They aren't just reading the words, they are bringing them to life. Theater actors have the entire stage to fill with their presence. Film actors have their body framed by the camera lens. Voice actors have only their lips. How do you bring all that life that the character needs just through your voice? Emotions. Place yourself there as that character. A person speaks differently if they are on the battlefield versus holding a sleeping child. Are they tired or maybe sad? Or is it all a ruse to get what they want? You have only your voice to illustrate this. You should take at least one acting class even before step one of the voiceover talent. You must first be an actor before you can focus on voice acting. Think of doctors. First, they study pre-med to get the basic understandings. Then they go into their field of specialty. The career here, at least to me, isn't separated out from the root stem of voice, but rather acting. Study acting, then focus on voice. You may run parallel with voice talent, much like a pediatrician might study closely with internal medicine, both doctors, but with different specialties. So step one, go through at least a beginner's seminar, workshop, what have you, to get the basic principles down. There are many more seminars for voiceover talent than there are for voice actors. 
These seminars and workshops will be very beneficial to you, but will not always line up exactly to a T with your career vision. I still highly recommend attending, watching, or reading these training programs because the gigs you want are not as easy to find as the general voiceover work. In addition, keep your acting skills sharp and partake in some improv. You'd be amazed how helpful improv is to voice acting. I myself am due for a tune-up. Step two, find a respectable coach to assist you with producing at least an animation demo. Many will argue that you will need a separate video game demo from an animation demo. And while there are differences, I personally don't feel they are as separate as the industry wants them to be. The majority of video game auditions I've seen have required custom demos, with no opportunity to provide your personal demo anyway. Your demos are a great way to market yourself, but always keep that in mind. 95% of the time, you will be asked to read a script sampling for that role, i.e. a custom demo. I've gotten gigs where I was approached because they loved my demo, and after going through the rate discussion, I was then asked to provide a custom demo to hash out the specific character sound. So while I'd already booked the job with the help of my animation demo, I still needed to provide a few variations of the voice they'd heard to make it unique. I would also recommend getting a commercial demo. While having a wide spectrum of voices is fun, most clients will be turned off to hearing this rather than the realistic conversational read they were requesting. Here's my personal experience. I learned the hard way that my character commercial demo I had produced was not considered industry standard for a voice actor's animation demo. I worked with both commercial and character commercial demos for roughly two years before I started studying voice acting through the Global Voice Acting Academy. If your coach doesn't explicitly state the difference between commercial and animation work, it is a clear indication that they are voiceover talent coaches only. That's not to say they aren't great at what they do, but what they do is not what you want for voice acting. Another indication for me was that I always had to stay in the realm of reality for my character commercial demo. I still read commercial scripts and only lightly played with vocal techniques to change my natural voice. Again, I don't regret creating my character commercial demo because it was affordable and I learned a lot from doing it. However, I now consider it a fusion of two genres, like a dubstep edition of Paco Bell's Canon in B Major. Sure, it might have a sick beat and the sound of the future, but anyone looking for the classical rendition isn't going to be pleased. I could go on, but I think I've illustrated the beginnings enough for one episode. I am completely open to continuing discussing the various aspects of beginning your career, so feel free to comment below if you have anything you'd like for me to touch on or elaborate on. For now, I will leave you with the incredibly talented D. Bradley Baker's website, I Want to Be a Voice Actor, for more FAQ and starting step goodness. I hope you feel I gave you an information overload because that means you learned something that you didn't already know. Stay tuned for part two, where I go in more depth into what it takes to move forward. But for now, remember that you are loved, you are worthy, and whatever you are struggling with will pass. Until next time, stay crazy.